Uh, there's a song that uh, you probably heard around this time of the year. It's called, It's the Most Wonderful Time of the Year. Anybody know that song? I heard it about ten times this week just to make sure I got all the lyrics because I'm going to sing with you. No, just kidding. I'm not going to sing. <laughs> that's not one of the wonderful things God is doing here, have me sing, right? <laughs> but that's what people think, right? It's the most wonderful time of the year. Now that depends, in my opinion, to who you talk to, right? There are people that love this time of the year and there's people that just absolutely hate it. Especially if it's Black Friday and you're trying to get into Walmart or something. You know, it's a terrible time of the year. But for me personally, I just, I just love this time of the year. I just have a ball. I love the music. I love the food. I, I think even the attitude of the people is better. You know, when you go out, everybody's like smiling and, hi, happy holidays. And you're like, ah, Merry Christmas. Forget the holidays. Merry Christmas. <laughs> but I think even the, the attitude of the people changes during this time of the year. And I just absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite times. As a matter of fact, if you want to come, you know, every Friday night for the next two Fridays. We already did it Friday. But for the next two Fridays, the Spanish ministry gets together. We take the two white buses and we go caroling from house to house. Anybody done that lately? We, we love to do it. So, you know, we just got to go and do that. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I love it. But when it comes to, to our series, you know, we've been studying about investigating Jesus. You know, I started thinking, okay, what was this time of the year for the Jewish people back then? And, you know, there was no Christmas yet, obviously. Jesus wasn't in the picture yet. So how was the time? And I started thinking maybe it was just like any other time. Maybe there was no big deal. You know, God hadn't talked to them in a long, long time. They hadn't seen any angels come over and appear and no prophets. So, I don't know, maybe it was just another time, you know, another day, just like any other day. That was until the angel appeared to Zacharias. You remember the story? He came to the temple. And then last week, we talked about how the angel appeared to Mary, right? And now, third time was starting to change. And I, I was starting to think, you know... If you know me, you know that I, I don't know, I just think a lot. I just go out there, you know. But I'm thinking of this conversation with Mary and the angel. And Gabriel comes and says, Mary, I got great news for you. Yeah, what's that? You're going to get pregnant. Uh, excuse me? <laughs> yeah, you're going to be pregnant with the Son of God. Well, that's great, but angel, just so you know, you know I'm a virgin. I, I just can't have him yet. Well, don't worry about that, Mary. We got that handle. And can you imagine... What was going on through this young woman's mind? I mean, we see the answer, right? In verse 38, she says to the angel, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Now, how many of you have talked to Pastor Brian or to myself, you know, when Pastor Brian says, we need 10 guys to, for a volunteer work, and you come, Pastor Brian, man, I, I'm there. But whatever you need, you use me. I'm available. And Pastor Brian comes, hey, Jose, when we start this project, call so-and-so because he's available. Great, when I call, well, you know what, Jose, not today, bro. Uh, today's a bad day. You know, why don't you call me tomorrow? Maybe tomorrow I can do it. And we call him tomorrow, and then, you know, man, I, I have to go do this. I got to go do that. Maybe after I'm done, I'll call you back. You know how it goes, right? And I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe Mary went to the angel and said, hey, man, I'm here. Do with me as you please. And you know what it says? That the angel just took off. He just disappeared, right? The angel left her. And I'm wondering if after that she was sitting there going, Oh, my word. What did I just say? Did I just say do whatever you want? Um, how am I going to explain this to my dad? I can imagine her. I mean, remember, Mary is like 13, 14 years old. I can imagine her going home. Hey, Dad, um, you remember those prophets you've been telling me about? You know, you remember Isaiah, right? Yeah, yeah, of course we remember. You know, there's a story about a Messiah coming or something like that. How did it go? Well, baby, he's going to be born of a virgin. Really? <laughs> that's me, Dad. <laughs> no, that's not going to work, right? Maybe she'll go to mother first. Mom, let me talk to you from woman to woman. Honey, you're not a woman yet. Wait until you get married another year. Then you come. We'll talk about that stuff. You know? And, and I can imagine. How, how about Joseph? How am I going to tell Joseph? Hey, honey. And, you know, we've been studying the Bible together. We've been going to this small group. And uh, you remember the story about the Messiah? Well... You know, I can't even imagine what a 13-year-old would be thinking about how to explain this to the people around her. 
You know, and it's funny because the Bible doesn't tell us. You know, it, it kind of goes from one thing to the next. So he left her and then psh, no more. So let's read. Let's read in verse 39. Read with me. We're going to read from verse 39 to verse 45. And I'm going to use the, the New International Version. But the verses will be up there if you need them. It says, at the time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the, the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, as we come to you this morning, Father, we want to hear your voice. Father, I'm sure there's no one here that wants to hear Jose speaking for half an hour. They want to hear the voice of God. Father, and I pray that they will hear your voice this morning, Father. Father, thank you for using me as your instrument. But, Lord, I pray that my humanity will not interfere with your message this morning. So prepare our hearts, prepare our minds for your word, O oh Lord. And speak to us this morning, Father. Manifest yourself in here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I hope you saw that word in verse 39. It says that, in my translation, it says she hurried, hurried to a town. You know, that's an interesting word because the word hurried here, the, the one that they translated hurry, it means speed. It means haste. It actually means to do one's best full effort. Basically, you know what it's saying? It's that she got out of town in a heartbeat. You know, the New, York, New Yorkers will say she got out in a New York minute, right? She got out quickly, real quick. She got out of town. And I, and I think, you know, I, I, I just think that she didn't know how to explain this stuff. I think she went home and tried to explain. Maybe she slept overnight. Oh, my goodness, how do I say it? You know what? The angel said that Elizabeth was pregnant too. I'm going to Elizabeth's house. Hey, Mom, I'm going to see Cousin Elizabeth, you know. I just heard some news and I want to just go visit. Okay, so I'll see you later. I'm out. And she hurried, hurried on out of town. But why go to Elizabeth? Well, I thought about two things. First of all, I think Elizabeth can relate to her. You know, Elizabeth has suffered disgrace for, for being barren for all her life. You know, obviously she was maybe over 60, maybe over 70. So for at least 50 years of her life, she had been feeling disgraced because she was barren. And now God had taken her disgrace away by giving her a child. But Mary was going to feel this grace for being pregnant and not being married yet. And I think she went to Elizabeth because in, in her mind, Elizabeth could relate. She's been there. She has suffered this grace, and maybe she can help me suffer what I'm going to suffer now and go through this. And, and it's interesting to me because this is how God uses the experiences in our lives, is it not? He allows us to go through some experiences and suffer certain things so that then we, with that experience, can help other people go through the same suffering. The Bible says so in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 and 4. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves received from God. So my brother and my sister, do you feel overwhelmed by something you're going through right now? Let me tell you, there's somebody here that has gone through that before you. And they can help you go through that. Don't stay silent. Don't go through it alone. Let us walk with you. I think that's what Mary was doing. I think she was going to Elizabeth so Elizabeth could walk with her. Because Elizabeth could relate to her. And also, obviously, Elizabeth was pregnant now by a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. So she's going and saying, well, she's pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Guess what? 
she'll believe my story. She'll believe my story. When I go to there, Elizabeth, guess what just happened? Man, an angel came, talked to me, said, I'm going to get pregnant with the Son of God. What is Elizabeth going to say? Well, you're crazy. No. I understand where you're coming from because there was an angel that came to Zacharias and look at what happened. I understand that. And maybe she can text her aunt and say, hey, auntie, you know, I'm over here with Mary. And, you know, she's going to give you some great news. But do me a favor. Just believe what she says. Maybe she can help her out. I don't know, but that's my thinking here. And I'm thinking that maybe Elizabeth will believe her while others doubt. And Elizabeth can help her go through that. And to top it all off, you know, just like, like only God can do. In verse 43, Elizabeth said, but why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? You know, Elizabeth recognized that Mary's child was the promised Messiah. He said that she was full of the Holy Spirit, and she recognized that this is it. This is the Messiah. And she's saying, why am I so favored that the mother of my Savior will come to me, the mother of my Lord? Can you imagine what happened with Mary in her head? I mean, she's got all these days. I don't know how long it took her to walk from one place to the other, or maybe she took a bus or something like that. But can you imagine she's going through all this thing, all these doubts, and all of a sudden she hears from Elizabeth, you're going to have the Messiah. That's confirmation. That's confirmation. And, and it says here that, well, it doesn't say that, but you can, you can see it, that as soon as she heard this, Mary bursts into a song of praise. She just burst into the song of praise. So I can imagine this confirmation, what this did to her. And, and, and Mary didn't only say, you're going to be the mother of the Lord. She says, you're going to be the mother of my Lord, of my Lord, of my Savior. And Elizabeth call her, calls her blessed. It says, blessed are you among women. Blessed are you. Oh, that's your water, Mary? Oh, great. <laughs> Mary calls her blessed. And, and it's interesting because uh, there's a man called Robert Stein. And Robert Stein says this, according to contemporary Jewish ideas, a woman's greatness was measured by the greatness of the children she bore. You saw that? The greatness of the mother was measured by how great her son was. Who was going to be greater than God, than Jesus? No one. She was blessed. Elizabeth was right. You are blessed among all other women. And even though Elizabeth herself was a blessed woman, she was going to have John the Baptist. I mean, Jesus called him the greatest man alive, right? She was blessed too. But she recognized that her ble the blessing to Mary was even greater. Mary was a greater woman than even her because her child was going to be greater than her own child. And Mary was so blessed that she burst into a song of praise. Read with me in verses 45 to 47. It said, Blessed is she who has believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, my soul, my soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. You know, I find that interesting that Mary was blessed. But we can't relate to that blessedness. You know, nobody before her, nobody after her is going to be the mother of, of the Son of God. Nobody. So no other woman was going to experience that level of blessedness, if we can call it that way. So, so it's hard for us to look at that and say, okay, she was blessed. I'm not going to have that kind of blessing. And we can't relate. But Mary was blessed in many other ways too. She wasn't just blessed in that particular way. She was blessed in many other ways too. And, and so I am interested in that. And I look at this and I say the first thing, Mary was blessed for her belief. Mary was blessed for her beliefs. It says right there in Verse 45, it says, blessed is she who has believed. You know, it is obvious that Mary believed the word of God. She didn't only believe the written word of God. And you're going to see as we go through the song that she includes psalms and prophets, the words of, of psalmists and prophets into this song. It is obvious that the word of God was foundational in Mary's life. Mary believed the word of God. And I'm wondering, is the Word of God that foundational in my life? 
Is it that foundational in your life? I mean, if all of a sudden you got really excited about some news and you decided to sing a song of praise, will the word of God be in there somehow? Or would it be just Jose's jingle, you know? She burst into a song of praise. And it's incredible. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord. The Mary believed that Jesus was worthy of praise. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord. You know what the soul is in the person? It's all the emotions. It's all our thinking. It's, it's who we really are inside. And she's saying, my soul, my whole being glorifies the Lord. Glorifies Jesus. Says her spirit, my spirit rejoices. And it's interesting. Her spirit rejoices and, and, and her soul responds by magnifying the Lord. By glorifying the Lord. Mary believed that Jesus was worthy of praise. But she also, Mary believed in Jesus for salvation. Mary believed in Jesus for salvation. It says it right there in verse 47. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. My Savior. See, Mary, in this prepositional phrase, Mary is designating God not only as the object of her worship, but as the reason of her worship. She says, this could be translated as, my spirit rejoices on account of God, my Savior. God is the reason for my rejoicing. God is the reason. And she is recognizing the work of of God as the Savior of the world. Jesus is coming as the Savior of the world. And she is recognizing that the baby she's bringing into her, with her is the Savior that she's been studying about. She's recognizing it. Obviously, the question is, do you believe that today? Do you understand, like Mary did, the need for a Savior? We all have a need for a Savior, but we must recognize it. And we can see the example in Mary and in Elizabeth. Mary was blessed for her belief, and so can we. We can relate to that. Number two, Mary was blessed for being chosen, for being chosen. And we can have a whole message about being chosen. But read with me verses 49, 48 and 49, I'm sorry. Verse 48 says, for he was mindful mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Did you notice that? She says he was mindful of the humble state of the servant. Mary recognized her position before God. Mary recognized her position before God. And, and it's very interesting to me. She uses the same word servant here as she used in verse 38 when she said, I am the Lord's servant. And this is the Greek word dole. I want you to say that with me just so you can. I, I say it with a Spanish accent, obviously. But dole. Can you say that? Dole. That means a female slave. Okay, it's a female slave. The, the, the masculine term for that is doulos, doulos, all right? But she uses that word here, and, and she's understanding her position before God as a female slave of God. And it's interesting because it's the same word that Paul uses when he introduces himself in Romans, in Philippians, uh, Philippians, I just said it in Spanish, all right, Philippians. <laughs> Woo, I was just preaching it in Spanish, so... Uh, Philippians, please. <laughs> in Titus, he uses it. James, Peter, Jude, they use it to introduce themselves. Even John uses it in Revelation 1.1 when he's talking about the people that are going to receive the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I don't know if you know what that really means, but uh, a dolos, you know, in the Old Testament, uh, uh, a lord could have a slave for seven years. And at the end of seven years, they had to set him free. Okay? That's the year of Jubilee. And they had to set the person free. Now, the slave had the option. He could go home, you know, start a new life. I'm a free man. I pay my dues. I'm done. 
But many slaves, because of the love that they had for their Lord, for their owner, they will come back and say, I want to be your doulos or your doule. I want to be a free, voluntary slave for the rest of my life. You catch that? A free, voluntary slave for the rest of my life. And that is what Mary is saying here. Mary is saying, I am a free, voluntary slave of my Lord for the rest of my life. That's why she said, do with me as you want. I am your slave. And that's what God is looking from each and every one of us. We need to submit ourselves to God. God is looking for people. That will be fully submitted to him. People that will submit their will to his will. And their desires to his desires. That he can use for his work. That's what Mary's realizing here. She recognizes her position before God. But she also recognized, Mary recognized the gift of God. She says in verse 49, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. She recognizes that God is the giver and we are the receivers. She recognizes that he is the doer and we are the instruments. See, she recognizes not only her position, but she also recognizes that whatever is going to come is going to come because of the work that God is doing through her. And not because of anything she's done in the past or is going to do in the future. She recognizes him as the giver Him as the doer, it is a gift from the mighty one himself. The one that can do the impossible. Mary had a clear understanding and that's what we need to have. Do you understand your position before God today? Do you recognize your position? 2 Timothy 2, verse 20 and 21 says, In a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. That's what God wants. He wants you and me to be an instrument ready for any good work. But for that, I have to be willing to give. I have to be willing to submit myself to God. Are you realizing that like Mary did? Mary did, and she was blessed for it. The third thing I saw here is that that the blessing of Mary wasn't just a momentary blessing. She was blessed for eternity. Look at verses 50 to 51. To 55, I'm sorry. It says, His mercy extends to those who fear them. From generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. But has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. But has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel. Remembering to be merciful. To Abraham and his descendants forever. Even as he said to our fathers. How long was he going to be merciful to them? Forever. How long was this going to last? From generation to generation. You see, Mary recognized the eternality of God's work. Mary recognized that what God does doesn't last for a moment and then goes away. The fruit that God produces through us is eternal fruit. It's eternal fruit. Jesus calls it fruit that lasts in John 15, 16. Fruit that will last. And let me tell you, we could try to do our ministry with our own strength and with our own power. And I, and I can tell you, Brian is so good, he could probably get this ministry going for a while on his own strength. But you know what's going to happen? The fruit of that ministry will not last forever. Will not. The only fruit that lasts 
is the fruit of the work that the Holy Spirit does through each and every one of us. And Mary recognized the eternality of the work of God. Jesus said, apart from me, you can't do nothing. 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 Mary also recognized the reality or, or the assurance, the certainty of what God will do. You know, God is not like us. God is not like, like me. Let me not include everybody. But God is not like me. Sometimes I go to somebody and say, hey, man, tomorrow I'm going to do this and that and the other. And then the next day I forget about it and don't get done. And then they call me a week later. Well, didn't you say you were going to do this? Oh, man, I forgot. Yeah, yeah, tomorrow I'll do it. And then tomorrow I forget again, right? God is not like that. When God says he's going to do something, you know what? It's as good as done. It's as good as done. We see that all the verbs that Mary used here are past tense verbs. But she's not only remembering what God did in the past. She's not saying God did this and he's not going to do it again. What she's saying is God did it, he's still doing it, he's going to do it for eternity. That's his nature. What did he do? Just real quick, about six things that he did here. He scattered the proud. He scattered the proud. He's talking about the way of thinking of the people. It says... It says that he scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's talking about a mentality here, a mindset, the people that think they're all that. People that think that they can do it without God. Oh, I don't need God. I'm good enough. I'm good enough. I don't need him. And it's interesting to me because that word scatter is like, like you know, when animals come to your, I don't know if you have ducks around your neighborhood, but I got a bunch of ducks in my neighborhood. And when they come, what do you do? You shh, shh. And then they come back. and That's what he's talking about. He just shoo away all the proud. He scattered them. They cannot be in the presence of God. He scattered the proud. He exalted the humble. He exalted the humble. What a great example of Mary and Elizabeth. Who could be more humble than those two? And yet he exalted them to be the most blessed woman in the history of the world. He exalted the humble. He filled the hungry. He helped his servant. He remembered the merciful and he fulfills his promise. And Mary's talking to this about some, like something is already done because if God said it, it's already done. If there is a promise in this word about you and about me, you know what? Write it down because it's already done. What God promised, he will do. And Mary realized that. I think you will agree with me that, that Mary was blessed, right? She was blessed. I mean, blessed because God was mindful of her and considered her perhaps even more than her own society was going to consider her. Maybe people weren't even paying attention to this little 13-year-old. But God considered her. But you know what? Just like God was mindful of Mary... He is mindful of you. Just like he had Mary in his mind, he has you in his mind. Did you know that? Psalm 8, 3 and 4 says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? Here the psalmist is thinking, man, look at all this stuff. But yet he thinks with me. He thinks about me. He's mindful of me. He even talks to me. What is man that you're so mindful of him? Psalm 115, 12 and 15 says, the Lord has been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. But listen in verse 13. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. Who's those who fear the Lord? It's us, right? It's Christians. It says he will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. And listen to this prayer. I love it. May the Lord give you increase more and more, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven. And earth. Wow. Listen, the Lord is mindful of you. The Lord has you in his mind. 
Even when nobody else is paying attention, even when you think your life is worthless because you're all alone and nobody cares, the Lord has you in his mind. Isn't that great? I love that idea. I love the idea that God, the God of heaven, is thinking about me. I don't even want to think about myself. And he's thinking about me. So now it's our time. Let's talk about a little bit about application here. Mary was very blessed. And there's some ways that Mary was blessed that we will never be blessed because nobody's ever going to be the mother of Jesus again. But there were some blessings that are there for her and were there for us. That was her time. But now is our time. Now is our time. I think it's time. I think it's time that we recognize what God has done for us. I think it's time we recognize what God has done for us. You know, Christmas is not all about lights and trees, about gifts and food, even though we like all that stuff. It's not about that. You know, Christmas is a time when we remember his time. It's a time when we remember that God sent his only son to die on that cross to pay the price for my sin so that I can have eternal life with him. That's what this time is all about. It's his time. And it's time that we remember what God has done for us. Do you recognize what God has done for you? Do you? It's time we recognize what God has done for us. It's also time we recognize our position before God. It's time we recognize our position before God. You know, many of us are playing games with this thing called Christianity. Many. Many. And that's why you keep coming back and saying, man, today I feel great. God is all over me. I'm doing great. And then tomorrow you feel like you don't belong. Right? It's time we recognize our position before God. Are you saved? Are you an instrument of God? Are you a duole or a doulos of God? It's time. And it's time we recognize the eternality of his work. You know, who I was 24 years ago, I'm not today. And you know what? I will never be that guy again. Because the work that got started in me is good for eternity. The work that got started in me and the work that he started in you is good for for eternity. You will never be that same person again. And it's time we recognize the eternality of his work in our lives. In Philippians 1.6 it says, He who began a good work in you will carry it unto completion unto the day of Christ Jesus. We will never be the same again. Never. And the work he started in me is done. It's as good as done. It's a done deal. I'm going to be better and better every single day. And when I meet Jesus Christ, I'm going to be perfect. And so will you. For those of you that keep questioning whether you're saved or not, the eternality of the work of God should give you assurance of your salvation. And John 6, 37 to 39 says, All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. Listen to the will of God, please. That I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. My friend, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're in. You're done. It's good for eternity. You don't have to doubt it again. You don't have to keep coming back. Well, I don't know. Well, this and that. Well, I accepted it, but the preacher wasn't good. And I don't know if I did the right prayer. Forget it. It's done. Let's move on. The work he started is good for eternity. And you're secure in him forever. Ephesians 1.13 says, And you also were included in Christ Jesus when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. The promised Holy Spirit. We've been sealed. We've been sealed. 
by the Holy Spirit of God. And the work that he started is good for eternity. My friend, it's time. I know it's Christmas time. It's Christ mass time, right? Christmas time. It's his time. But I want to ask you a question. Is it his time in your life? Is it his time in your life? Or is this your own time? Is it his time in your life?